my area of ex expertise is in the medical and surgical uh, treatment of heart disease. What that really means, <laughs> and translated into, you've seen people with a heart attack, coronary disease, endothelial damage of the inside of the vessel wall, which blocks the vessel, causes poor blood flow to the heart, and therefore damage, and the heart dies itself in certain areas. In addition, aortic stenosis is another type of disease. It's a calcium buildup on the vessel. The valves are just like doors. They open and they close. So there's two malfunctions they can have. They cannot open enough, or they open too much. And we'll just look at something called aortic stenosis. Why is coronary disease so important? Mainly it affects over 10% of the population in the entire U United States. It's the leading cause of death. Every 42 seconds, someone has a heart attack. Every minute, someone dies from heart disease. The annual cost of all of this is over $200 billion a year. So I want to just go on a journey talking about the past the present, and the future. Stephen Paget was a well-regarded surgeon in the late 1800s. He uh, founded Paget's Disease of the Bone. He was thought to be the founder of pathology along with Verkau. But he made the statement early on, surgery of the heart has probably reached the limit set by nature to all surgery, no new method, and no, no new discovery can overcome the natural difficulties that attend a wound of the heart. So what he was saying is that anytime there's damage to the heart or we need to operate, I feel it's impossible. Well, let's make an analogy. It is like a mechanic working on an engine, except now the engine is actually running. There we go. So, Really, the underlying theme of this discussion is more about how do we deal with the impossibilities. We have thousands of thoughts on a daily basis. It's all really about the growth, the, the, the seed of growth for all of our desires, the desires to achieve uh, um, the extraordinary. From this, as long as we believe that we can do it, it certainly will happen. The impossible, therefore, can become possible. It took over 60 years, but in the 1950s, Lily High at the University of Minnesota figured out that, well, if we open up the heart, we're going to lose a lot of blood. And where is that blood going to go? He thought, well, I could connect it to tubing and have it go to another recipient. The recipient in this case was the patient's father. The son had a ventricular septal defect, which is a hole right in the ventricle, the hole in the heart. And the blood released came to the patient's father and then back to the patient. It was their first successful operation of the heart in the 1950s. This actually led to the development of, by John Gibbons of the heart-lung machine. So this was a major technological revolution. Because what happened now is that over millions of operations are now performed throughout the world. So what about the present? What are we doing now? Well, this is the way we do the operation currently. We actually open up the middle of the chest. I see people uh, closing their eyes. <laughs> Let me tell you, it's only going to get worse then. <laughs> you might want to cover your ears. Uh, and so what we see here is that when the chest is open, we've exposed the pericardium, which is the sac around the heart, and here's the heart. And it's allowed us to do operations such as on the blood vessels to make sure blood flow, on the valves to make sure if they're infected, if they leak, if they're stenotic, that we replace them. The aorta, which is the blood vessel of the body that allows the blood to circulate throughout the body, to repair that if it's torn or enlarged or ruptured. There's new technology coming along now 
called TAVR, transaortic valve replacement. So what you see here is that the catheter is passed up through the femoral artery, through the aorta, and up to where the aortic valve resides. At the end of this catheter is the valve itself and is crimped on the catheter. It is then expanded and then deployed such that we don't even have to open the chest to do this operation. I think this is going to be a technique within the next several years that is probably going to take over open heart surgery. This is called robotic surgery. What we see here, multiple arms. There are about five or six arms that are inserted into the chest cavity to expose the heart. And the surgeon isn't even at the table. The surgeon is over here at a console. What I find when I've tried to use this is it's probably if you learn how to play video games. So if any of you are doing that, now is the time. But there are certain barriers to minimally invasive cardiac surgery. One of those is finding the optimal procedure technique. Unfortunately, we're talking about doing this on live people to start, and it takes many years sometimes to do that. There's a steep learning curve. Sometimes you have to operate on 50 to 100 people to really get it right. Capital requirements. That robot that we showed you is over a million and a half to $2 million and there's an annual cost of about a quarter of a million dollars a year. And the reimbursement constraints. Whenever something is new coming out, just like there's another procedure that I do called bronco uh, navigational bronchoscopy, the different third-party payers that are in medicine now, they might do experimental and will not pay for it. What this really results in, just what I wanted to show, is that in 1960, the gross domestic product it was only 5% of the overall cost. And now we fast forward to 2018, and we're already up to 20%, which is over $3 trillion. And the expected growth is that by 2050, it'll be over 60% of the gross domestic product. So in the past, it was very affordable. Although, <laughs> and in the present, we don't know if it's going to be sustainable. So for those of you who I saw cover your eyes, you might want to do that again. <laughs> do I need to push it? You want to cut it down a little? Cut it down? So, so, so what we see here is opening the sternum, the breastbone there, to expose the heart. This was one I just did a a couple of days ago, we've done several. Here's the pericardium, the sac around the heart. And these are the lungs that you see expanding back and forth as the patient is on the, the ventilator. What I'm doing here is opening the sac around the heart to actually expose the heart. You see the right ventricle on top. The left ventricle is sitting below. Here is the pulmonary artery where you see the suction catheter. And here's exposure of the aorta and the right atrium. This is the tubing that's going to be connected to the heart-lung machine. So this is the right atrium that it's connected to. So we take the blood from the heart so that now we can quiet the heart and work in a bloodless field. This is going into the aorta. We're returning oxygenated blood, free of any debris, back to the rest of the body for the brain. We are all connected now. You see the heart beating. And now we've clamped the aorta, we've stopped the heart, and at this point, and this is the picture of the heart-lung machine, as you saw, which came about in the late 1950s. I'm opening up the aorta at this time to expose the valve. Here's a bicuspid valve. Normally, there should be three leaflets. There's only two. This is a congenital abnormality, and this is why this person has such problems. They were only in their 50s, very short of breath, uh, a lot of chest pain. This is the bicuspid valve. This is the new valve that is uh, made from pericardium of a cow. And this is what is being implanted. We see it implanted here within the aorta. And now I'm closing up the aorta. If I 
tried to show any of this minimally invasive, you wouldn't see any of it. Now all the tubing is out. The heart is back to beating. We close the sternum with wires to bring the chest together. We couldn't do this without all our team. (laughs) And this patient was done on Monday and should be going home tomorrow. So, So what does the future look like? Of course, I could start talking about a number of different items, but there's something that is interesting to me now that actually I'm starting to get involved with, and that's called CRISPR. Just by a show of hands, how many people have heard of CRISPR? Oh, (laughs) very knowledgeable audience. What does it stand for? No. (laughs) So CRISPR is clustered, regularly, interspace, short, palindromic, repeat. So palindromic meaning, of course, backwards or forwards, the same. And what that is, is that bacteria for billions of years have been able to understand the genetic code. What happens is this is the bacteria, whenever a virus or other microorganism invades the cell, the DNA of the bacteria is able to actually recognize this and incorporate it between the spacer. Once it does that, through transcription, the CRISPR RNA, the messenger RNA, is produced. And once that's produced, any time there's any other invasion of a microorganism or a virus, it recognizes that gene and incorporates itself in the exact location. What it's able to do is actually then destroy that gene so that it's no longer functional. So it can either silence it so that it is non-functional, or it can edit it to actually have a totally new function that is at the direction of uh, the lab. This is currently being done today. So what are the benefits of CRISPR? I bring this up mainly from the standpoint, I think we could see eradication, eradication of heart disease and cancer. They're already working on it for cures of infectious diseases such as AIDS. In addition, for genetic diseases, from Alzheimer's, Marfan syndrome, a number of things. The one that I'm actually involved with is with Fuchs disease. So again, the boy who had the ventricular septal defect maybe could be treated with CRISPR. Coronary artery disease actually could be eradicated. The main issues with disease such as that is one of the risk factors, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, diabetes, uh, that's a reversible process through genetic engineering. Also that of lung cancer. I do lobectomies for lung cancer. In the future, we'll see if that's still the case. Now there's talk, could you actually be taller, more muscular? Could it be that you change your eye color? Or, as we look at this, we would say, we're looking at this picture from right to left. But now it might be that you're looking at it from left to right. Because now people are talking about working on aging. So my overall thought as far as this process is, is that the way we think develops into our belief system and our desires. And from that, we form our habits and our habits shape our future. Thank you.